Picture yourself enjoying the bright sun and sparkling waters of Greece, and you'll get a glimpse at the fantastic world detailed by M.A. Monin in her debut novel. Agatha nominated for Best First Novel, Monin's Death in the Aegean crackles with tension, romance, and danger. Welcome to Blackbird Writers Presents Author Interviews, and welcome to you, Mary. Thank you, Sharon. Thanks for having me. So glad to have you here today, and I absolutely just adored this book and can't wait for your next one to come out, so just, you know, get on that. Um, <laughs> so I want to start um, just by uh, talking about your travels to Greece, which is where the book is set. Well, um, the picture behind me, my husband took when we went to Santorini, uh, but to be honest, it started with me wanting to go to Gre uh, Crete. I've been in love with Crete since I was a teenager. When I lived in Germany, my dad was in the army and he would go to Crete every summer on military exercises. And he would come back with Greek vases and leather sandals and lovely flakati rugs. And uh, I just, it really sparked my imagination. I fell in love with it. And then when I was in the Air Force, I met my husband who had been stationed on Crete before I met, before we met. And um, he also had those same lovely Greek vases and flakatis. And I finally talked him into going back and taking me <laughs> with him a few years ago. <laughs> so we went to Athens, Santorini, and Crete. And we just absolutely loved it. And being... Being interested in archaeology, I made sure when we were on Santorini to visit Akrotiri and um, on Crete to visit uh, Knossos Palace. Yeah, just amazing. And and you really you make you make those sites just come alive um, in the book. So thank you. <laughs> um, so uh, you know you've you've been dealing with or not dealing with, but but immersed in <clears throat> these Greek artifacts and things forever. And so why choose the snake goddess as your inspiration? Well, first, the snake goddess is an iconic Minoan um, figure. And when we went to, on Santorini, when we went to Akrotiri, I learned that, um, well, Akrotiri is a Bronze Age town, a Minoan town, and it was buried in the massive volcanic eruption around in this 17th century BC uh, that it just destroyed the island. So they've been excavating it. And the, though they've found lots of household items like loom weights and pots galore and things like that, they the, they've only found a single gold item. And it was a statue of a gold ibex, um, very carefully kept in a clay box uh, and buried under the in the floor, buried in the floor um, at some point. And that really sparked my imagination. And I thought, what if um, snake goddesses statues, which were found on in Knossos Palace, which on Crete, which is not too far away and is the center of the Minoan civilization at that time. What if a, a fabulous gold statue of a snake goddess was found at Akrotiri? What would you know, what kind of people would come see it and how would they interact? And that's where the mystery began. Yeah. And it's, yeah, it is just absolutely riveting. And, and I had to just like keep stopping and looking up pictures and looking up, um, doing like more reason. I'm like, is this real? Oh, this part is. Oh, and good. I would just, good. I would just get research. So, <laughs> I'd get so excited, you know, probably just doing, a, you know, a, a tenth of the research that you did, but it was really fun. Um, because yeah, you just, you really do make it come alive. Um, but, well, there is, um, another, um, gold artifact, the bees of Malia pendant. And I was wondering if you've ever seen that and can you tell us a little bit about that? Yes, actually. So when I decided it was my artifact that was going to get stolen for the, um, for the book was going to be a gold snake goddess. Uh, of course, I had to research uh, Minoan gold. And um, when we were on Crete at the Heraklion um, Archaeological Museum, they do have the Malia, the, it's called the bee pendant from Malia. Um, and we saw it in person there. And we also saw the snake goddesses. But I also did a lot more um, 
research into all the different techniques that the gold workers, the Minoan gold workers, um, were very, very highly skilled at. Yeah, so, yes. I, it was that was one of those things that I had to look up, and and uh, yeah, just a stunning, stunning piece. Yes, and just to think, so long ago they were so skilled. I just it, it just really impresses me. I know, I love it. Um, part part of uh, the things that people kind of mention in the book is that um, this this might be where the myth of Atlantis came up. Um, it, it, do you have any like did you what kind of research did you do for that? Uh, well, um, I'm an avocational archaeologist, which basically means I'm a hobbyist. So I read a lot about it. And most, most scientists and historians today do believe that the um, uh, the actual occurrence of the volcano just destroying Akrotiri and um, the island of Thera, which is Santorini, so long ago was what Plato had in mind when he um, told his lesson on good governance. Um, it's you know, <laughs> Atlantis is not a real place. He just, Plato used it as a lesson for, um, uh, as an example of bad governance on his lesson of, of Athens as being a good form of government. Um, and so that's where I, I, I was just always fascinated about, you know, the reality behind the legends. And when you go there to, to Akrotiri and see how modern, the buildings were their um, sewer system. They had indoor plumbing that led to, uh, you know, sewers that led underneath the streets. I mean, it, it's just incredibly modern uh, for its time. And and then, of course, the knowledge was lost and had to be regained. Um, so it's pretty pretty impressive. Uh, yeah, I um, I'm I personally am not good in sunshine, uh, and. Um, I just, I really want to go there after reading your book and I would just follow in Stephanie's steps. And see um, sunscreen, use a lot of sunscreen. <laughs> so uh, speaking of Stephanie, your main character, um, she's a private banker. Um, and this yes. is never a profession that has even crossed my radar before. So uh, I think it was an interesting choice for a main character um, because her integrity is so important to her. So rumors can just ruin her career. So uh, tell me about the research you did on that. Okay, so um, what I did was I, I, I knew I needed a, I needed Stephanie to have a career where she was um, uh, familiar with, with wealthy clients where, but not specifically, you know, one herself. She was very familiar with the well, you know, wealthy, and she knew their idiosyncrasies and how to deal with them. Um, and so I went to one of my local banks, and I I took a, a banker out to lunch, <laughs> treated her to lunch, and just plied her with all kinds of questions on um, uh, the positions there at the bank. And she's the one that that. Uh, said, well, a private banker, basically, you know, you get assigned the the wealthy, the wealthiest clients, and you take care of their, their needs, you know, whatever they are, you know, as far as the bank is concerned. And now Stephanie also, she's, she was up for vice president for, and promised the position for three years. So when it went to someone else, she had quite, quite a chip on her shoulder. She's, she's a disgruntled Private, <laughs> just private, banker. private banker. <laughs> yeah, very much. Oh, and I, I, I was full of indignation on her part. So, um, <laughs> well, well done. Yes, I figured it was something that a lot of people, a lot of readers, would be able to identify with. <laughs> you put in all those long hours and hard work, and the job goes to somebody else, and you just want to. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um. So with Stephanie, um, while she's in in Greece, she's trying very, very hard to be spontaneous, 
but she is at heart a planner um, and she plans for all of her steps and then all of the contingencies and things like that. So um, I was kind of wondering, which are you? Are you a planner or are you spontaneous? And and do you change it all when you're on vacation? <laughs> I am totally a planner. <laughs> when I write, I'm a plotter. When we go on vacation, um, I like to plan. I like to know the things that I'm not going to miss. And I'll tell you why I've gotten that point. When we went to Santorini, we just planned, I think we had three days there. And we thought, I thought, okay, we're going to see this, this, and this. Well, what I didn't do was look up the hours and the days they were open. And so we missed um, Ancient Thera. It was one of the places um, at the top of a mountain that would have been really nice to visit, but they were closed on the day we went or on the day we had free to go. Um, so that was disappointing. And there was a, a museum that was also closed on the next day or, you know, it, they, when we had something else planned, it's like, well, crap, I should have planned better. I should have looked and not thought, okay, everybody will be open if it's not Sunday. That's not true. <laughs> so now I'm even more of a planner when we go on vacation. <laughs> I... But I do like to leave, I'll leave space for, you know, if we want to make a change or whatever, I'm good with that. And I'm also good with just laying around at the hotel if I'm exhausted, because that happens too a lot on vacation. <laughs> You know, sometimes you, you don't want to come back from vacation needing a vacation. So a little, a little R&R. Yes. Is right. <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, so I think we would be compatible on vacation together because I am totally that same way. Uh, <laughs> um, and I'd love to go to England and bath. <laughs> I, I will be happy to show you around. <laughs> uh, um, all right, so your main character is um, in a foreign country um, that she's been to before, but it's been years. And I'm wondering, how does that affect her her confidence? Is is she who she normally is, or is she a little more gumption or a little more cautious? Well, I would say she's a little, she has a little more gumption, as you say. She's eager and excited and uh, she had that chip on her shoulder about spending all her time working. So she was going, she's going to go out and embrace opportunities. I'd say she's, she's very confident, even when she's wrong. <laughs> <laughs> and when she shouldn't be. <laughs> <laughs> she's very confident in her <laughs> mistakenness. Um, but yes, I wanted to give, give her that eagerness to go out and explore and not be too timid. Yeah, sometimes when you're in a strange place, it's it's kind of like a nobody knows me. I can do what I want, and, and oh. sometimes it's a nobody knows me. I'm going to be trapped if anything goes wrong. Um, so yes. and she and has those, that. yeah, she has those thoughts, but she she pushes through. Yes, <laughs> she's delightful. I I enjoyed spending time with her. Um, <laughs> so um. So there is a very interesting man, Tomas, um, also involved in the plot, and um, and again, this is where where her her confidence kind of takes the end. And I was just, I had certain vision in mind, but I wondered if if you cast them in a movie, who would you use for actors? Okay, so um, for Stephanie, uh, I don't know if many readers have have seen this, but on BritBox, there's, um, or no, not BritBox, it's on Netflix, the Spanish version of Grand Hotel, Amea Salamanca uh, plays Alethea, and she is gorgeous. Can I show you a picture? Please. I don't know if I could. I'll... Um, you probably have to put it right in front of your face, but. <laughs> okay. Oh, that's right. Okay. So this is Amea Salamanca. As she. As oh, seen yeah. Her. No, that's perfect. Yes. <laughs> that's on the Spanish Grand Hotel. And we watched that on Netflix. And I just thought, oh my gosh, that's what Stephanie looks like. <laughs> so now here's the funny thing. Um, I found the perfect guy that that looks like Tomas and I, um, or Tomas, 
I'm having the hardest time pronouncing his name. So he in book two, he does not have, she doesn't say it with an accent. She says Thomas. <laughs> <laughs> but this is Julian Lumen from um, the Brit Boxes, uh, the Majorca Files. Oh, oh yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. Oops. And that is, that is exactly how I pictured uh, Thomas. Oh, and it's and kind of funny. It. I wrote this story like years before I saw it. And as soon as I saw that show, I I told my husband, I said, oh, Bob, that's Thomas right there. <laughs> <laughs> that's perfect. Oh, I love that. <laughs> okay. That's all picture from now on. Um, <laughs> all right. So um, my next question as we start to wind down is where will Stephanie's next adventure take us? Ah, she goes on to Italy, Milan, and Venice. Yay. <laughs> on the, yes, on the black oh, okay. market trail of a Renaissance pendant called the Borgia Peacock. I can't wait. <laughs> um, <laughs> all right. And finally, where can our friends and fans find you? Okay. So on social media, I'm on Facebook. Twitter and Instagram. In person, I'll be at a couple of different conferences this year. I'm going to Malice Domestic and VoucherCon, and I'll be in Louisiana at the Books Along the Tesh Literary Festival. My husband is from Louisiana, and we thought, oh, let's go there, and they kind of throw that together. Um, James Lee Burke's, uh, oh my gosh, I forgot the name of his character, his, his character, Dave Robichaux is from, you know, from New Iberia, Louisiana. So we're going to go hit that one at the end of March. Awesome. Awesome. And just, uh, I want to loop back to Malice Domestic. Death in the Aegean was nominated for Best First Novel. So absolutely 100%. Congratulations on that. I was so excited when I saw that. Um, Thank you. So, <laughs> so for those of you who have... Uh, who were at Malice last year or will be at Malice this year, please keep Mary in mind when you're doing your voting because we want to see that as the winner. <laughs> yes, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> all right. So thank you so much for being here with us today. And thank you all for watching. Thank you for having me. It was great talking to you. Bye. Bye-bye.